Continuing with Hebrews, uh, since we've taken a couple weeks off, I wanted to uh, really quickly just uh, summarize for you uh, a, a bit of the background, yeah, and then maybe next week I won't say anything about that anymore. But uh, just a quick reminder that with many scholars, I take Hebrews as, as a, a sermon type letter. It was a, really a sermon that's put in written form that was written to a group of Christians who were being tempted to reject Christianity for some form of Judaism, which means that uh, at least a significant number of them, they had, had some kind of prior affiliation with Judaism. And the purpose of the letter was to urge these Christians to hold fast to their confession of faith. And the theme that the writer sounds in warning them not to turn from the Christian faith is the unqualified supremacy of Christ. He wants them as they're being tempted to drift away and to turn back to the comfort of their lives in Judaism. He wants them to see the Lord Jesus Christ, to see the one from whom they would be turning. And that's an important thing for us to see that vision. We have to present that vision to people who are in danger. Now the recipients probably were a segment of the Roman church, although that's debated, that's, uh, that's how I'm taking this. They probably were a segment of the Roman church, perhaps one or more predominantly Jewish house churches. And if that's correct, then the letter probably was written in the mid-60s, right before the outbreak of the severe persecution of the Roman church under the emperor Nero. And you've read about that, where he would light his gardens with Christians and all that kind of thing. So uh, just to remind you of, of where we are now, as he begins the letter, the first four verses, we have this introduction. Verses 1 and 2, the first part of chapter 2, uh, of verse 2 of, of chapter 1, he makes the point that the Son, Jesus Christ, is the climax of divine communication. The one in whom the, the piecemeal and diverse revelations of the Old Testament come together and find their fulfillment. So he is the, he's the climax, he's the epitome of God's communication to mankind. And then the second part of verse 2 through verse 4 of chapter 1, the writer makes some really amazing and powerful assertions about the person, work, and status of the Son. And we've heard these things so many times, it's easy to let them slip by and to not really hit you. But he says, the writer says, that God appointed the Son heir of all things. He is exalted to that level. He says that God made the universe through the Son. And I always stop on that because when we talk about uh, comparing Jesus to religious teachers in the world, I just shake my head. I mean, yes, he is a religious teacher. But come on, you know, he, he's the one... God made the universe through him. He says that the Son is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature. The Son sustains all things by his powerful word. The Son provided purification for sins. The Son sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And the Son became as much greater than the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So he says all of these tremendous, powerful things about the Son in the opening of this sermon. Then in verses 5 through 14, what we were looking at when we ended, he stresses the superiority of the Son to the angels. And he stresses that. We were looking at this last time. I want to say a little bit, and I'll, I'll go to, I split this up on two slides, and I'll pick up reading when, when I, I click to the next slide. But if you remember in, uh, in verse 5, he speaks of the Son's unique relationship with the Father. And then in verses 6 and 7, he explains the inferior position of the angels, and as I was saying right when we finished two weeks ago, the point of verse 7, at least as, as I understand it, and this is when I was going through the thing that I've translated it in a minority way. Most of the translations don't do this, but I have a good backing, good reason for doing it. It just makes more sense to me to translate it this way. And Meg said that my, when I was saying that so quickly, it was about as clear as mud, but uh, you can read how I translate it here, and if you want to you know, ask about it, you can email me about it. But I, I think the point of it is, verse 7, is that angels as majestic and powerful as they are are in some way comparable to other created things that God uses for his purposes. They're but creatures. So he's sent by God as messengers and servants of others. So he is contra he is, he's making the case for the supremacy, the superiority of Jesus to the angels. And then he says, he picks up in, in verse, he says... Uh, in verse 8 he says, but regarding the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of justice is the scepter of your kingdom. 
You loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, anointed you with oil of gladness above your companions. Then in verse 10, And you at the beginning, Lord, firmly established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will pass away, but you continue, and they all will wear out as a garment, and you will roll them up as a cloak. As a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not end. He's quoting a psalm there. And he says, And regarding which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits being sent for service for the sake of those who are about to inherit salvation? I'll go back to 8 and 9. In verses 8 and 9, in contrast to what he said about the angels, the Son is addressed as God. Now, that's an interesting thing, right? You know, people sometimes say, well, Jesus isn't God. I say, well, you know, there are a number of verses where he's just flat addressed as God. And so he's addressed as God in contrast to the angels. And he's said to have an eternal throne that's ruled with justice. Because he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, God, God the Father exalted God the Son. He anointed him to a position that's above all others. And he's quoting here from Psalm 45 verses 6 and 7 in the Masoretic text. You remember I said the versification is a bit different in the Septuagint. He's really quoting from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The versification in some of the Psalms is different, so I just give you the Masoretic text versification. And he's quoting there from Psalm 45 verses 6 and 7. And then in verses 10 through 12, he says, The heavens and the earth were made by the sun in the sense... Or back to 10 through 12... The heavens and the earth were made by the Son in the sense that he's already noted. See, that the Son was God the Father's agent in the creation of the universe. And he's quoting another psalm there. So Jesus, he's saying, listen, he is not like angels. Yet we have people today in our world who will come and want to tell you that Jesus is an angel. You know, he's an angel. And I say, well, this is, no, he's not an angel. He's superior to any angel. And he makes that case, uh, he's arguing that quite strongly. Then he says that the created order as presently constituted. Now, he doesn't use those words, but that's what I think he's meaning. That the present order as presently constituted will be brought to an end. You say, well, how will it be brought to an end? He doesn't elaborate, but we see elsewhere that the way the present order will be brought to an end is that it'll be radically transformed into something different. This order as it exists now is going to be brought to an end because it's going to be radically transformed into something different, into something eternal and free from decay. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. See, all of creation is longing for the redemption. It longs to be free from the bondage to decay to which it has been subjected. So this whole created order is in the throes, okay, it's, it's decaying, And it longs to be freed and it will be freed. So this present order is going to come to an end. It's going to be changed. And it's going to be changed in that it's going to come through and to be something eternal free from decay. Whereas Jesus, on the other hand, remains forever because he's overcome death through the resurrection. Remember Romans chapter 6 verse 9, Paul says, Death no longer has mastery over him. There was a time he was subject to death. There was a time he was mortal. The God-man was mortal. The God-man died. But in the resurrection, he is now immortal, no longer subject to death. Death no longer has mastery over him. He came out of the grave. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. This This created order has not yet made that transition, but it will. But Jesus, uh, he remains uh, because he's overcome death through the resurrection. Then in verse 13, the writer quotes Psalm 110, verse verse, uh, 1, to where he had already alluded to this in chapter 1, verse 3. The superiority of the Son to the angels is evident because no angel has been exalted to God's right hand, a a position of supremacy. No angel has had that, uh, been exalted to this position of complete supremacy, as has been the Son. Okay, he's still making this case. You're going to see why he's doing this. You sit here and say, why is he going on making this case at such length about the supremacy of the Son to the angels? And we'll see. Because you remember he sits here and he goes on and he makes his arguments about the... He expounds on the nature of Jesus Christ and then he interjects in here these exhortations. All right, well, there's an exhortation coming that is going to be based on 
what he's saying about the supremacy of Jesus to the angels. And so that's where he's going. We're going to get to that in just a second. But he says, look, in, in verse 13, he's, you know, the superiority of the Son to the angels is evident uh, that no angel has been exalted to God's right hand as has been the Son. And on the contrary, angels are servants rather than rulers. See, they're ministering spirits sent on behalf of the ruler. They do the ruler's bidding. Okay? They do the ruler's bidding. Jesus is the one who's exalted. He's above all things. And the angels are ministering spirits who do the bidding of the ruler. And he's letting them see this, that he's greater than the angels. They serve on behalf of the ruler. They serve those who are about to inherit salvation, meaning the disciples of the exalted Lord. Okay? That's us. That's us. Now, I understand that people can get wrapped up into angels, especially in our culture today, where they, they kind of treat angels as, you know, you have little angel pins, and I get in trouble, and I rub the angel pin and this kind of stuff. You know, we can, we can make an idol out of angels. But we also can, you know, ignore the fact that they're real. Angels are real. Now, how do they work and what do they do? They're sent here as ministering spirits on our behalf. They do stuff. Okay? They, they're real. They're real spiritual beings. And so we can ignore them, and then we can have the other idea that we can go and, you know, basically pray to these angels and do that kind of stuff, which is, uh, which is no good. Now, here comes this first, this is the first uh, hortatory interjection, the first exhortation that he now, he interrupts his theme, interrupts, quote, you know, th this is part of the sermon movement. This is what he's doing. He's, he first is saying, listen, he's nailing down the supremacy of the son to the angels. And then he comes in with this exhortation. And he says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, therefore, I've been painting the idea that Jesus is superior to the angels. Therefore, we must pay even greater attention to the things that were heard, lest we drift away. Remember what's up with these folks, right? It looks like they're being tempted what? To just go back. I mean, life is hard. They're being pulled. There's a price to be paid for allegiance to Christ. It's difficult. Their family's shunning them. It looks like we're on the brink of some kind of deal going with the Roman emperor. He's showing signs that he's not really too happy with Christians. It looks like a really bad time to be a Christian, so it's kind of easy to just kind of, I think I'll just kind of come over here and stand with these folks. Okay, well, he's warning them very clearly, very strongly. He says, Therefore, we must pay even greater attention to the things that were heard, lest we drift away. For if the word that was spoken by angels was reliable and every transgression and disobedience received just punishment, these angels who are inferior to the Son, as I have just gone and shown you, if every, if, he says, if the word that was spoken by angels was reliable and every transgression and disobedience received punishment, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which having at first been spoken through the Lord. If, if disobedience and blowing off the angels received just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore the greater word of the Lord, who is superior to the angels? He says, he says if we neglect so great a salvation, which having at first been spoken through the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard... God giving further testimony both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and distributions of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Okay, so we have here, given the superiority of Christ to the angels, he says, therefore it is incumbent upon them and therefore it is incumbent upon us to pay even greater attention than we have been paying, than they have been paying. Pay even greater attention. Don't be apathetic. Don't neglect it. Don't take it for granted. You have to pay even greater attention than you have been paying to what you've heard. Which is the word through the Son, chapter 1, verse 2. The message of salvation, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. We have to pay heed to that. The danger of not doing so is that one will drift from God's ultimate revelation, will be pulled gradually toward an abandonment of one's commitment to Christ. This is how people go away from Jesus. If, if, if you've been paying attention, you have seen this. Somebody who's zealous for the Lord, somebody who's serving Christ faithfully, doesn't wake up one day and say, hey, you know what? I think I'm getting rid of Christ. I think I'm on my own today. That's not how it happens. And if you've been involved with people in Christianity at all, you have seen this happen, they start missing stuff. 
Well, what about service? You don't have to be a service. Services, services. What are you, just hung up on services? No, services are an indication of something. They're an indication of a priority and where your life is. And this is how it happens. There's this trend. You can see it. Hey, you know, miss here and there and, you know, miss. We don't come to church on Wednesday. We don't do this. We don't get with people when they have brother's breakfast or whatever it is. We just start ignoring people because we're really not all that into this Jesus thing, but we don't want to say that. And what happens? You start to see a pattern. There is a drifting away. Drift, drift, slowly, slowly, go over. And before you know it, just dead. Just don't care. So there are these warnings. There are these alarms. That's why people are interested when somebody's not around. It's not like, well, what are you, the police? No, it's because you're my brother or sister and I have a concern for you. And don't tell me that you're not coming here doesn't mean anything. Okay? Look, I've been around too long for that. You can save that for somebody who doesn't know anything. I know it means something. It's a sign. It's an indication. And so when people go and say, hey, everything all right? They're doing it because they care about you because this is an indication. And your prickliness about it simply reinforces the fact that it is a sign of something. The, ought to be, the response ought to be either talk to a person and say, you know, I am having some struggles. You know, either stuff just is, you know, doesn't seem really that real to me or something. Uh, but thank you. Thank you that you care about me. But anyway, you see this thing, it's an important point here, this idea of drifting away. He says, look, you have to focus, you have to, you cannot be apathetic, you cannot take this for granted. You can't sleepwalk through Christianity and think that the enemy is not going to take advantage of that. We have an enemy. He's smart, clever, powerful. And he's after you. Oh, no, I don't believe that. He's after you. And he's sitting here saying, okay, that's right. No, 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 no. Yeah, you, that's right. You don't need that stuff. Look, look, look. You've got other stuff to do. Uh, you don't need to pray. Praying, you know, look, catch that tomorrow. Don't worry about that. Praying, you know, that's just, uh, you know how it works. And you just drift. And we have, we have to apply ourselves. We have to be alert and we have to be helping, helping one another. And the motivation for heeding this admonition, he says, look, given that every transgression and disobedience of the words spoken by angels meaning the Mosaic law. Okay, that's what he's talking about here. Given that every, tra every transgression and disobedience of the word spoken by angels was justly punished, it follows that those who neglect the greater message of salvation given by the Son who's greater than the angels, well, they have no hope of escaping punishment. So here he's writing to people who are what? They're tempted, they're wandering, they're turning away from Jesus, they're going back to the old life and turning from the confession they had made that Jesus is Lord and I'm going to serve him with my life. And he says, listen, you wind up rejecting Jesus, you got no chance. You have no chance. There's no hope of escaping punishment. And he's warning them about the danger of being apathetic toward the gospel by telling them there are catastrophic consequences associated with that action. Now, if I say that to somebody today, if I warn somebody today that there are catastrophic consequences associated with their drifting away from Jesus, more likely than not, somebody will say, I'm mean. They're going to say, I'm not loving. You don't, you, don't, you don't really love God because I didn't come in and go, hey, it's okay, everything's wonderful. Do you see how shallow and cheap that is? Do you see what real love involves? That, to me, is just a cop-out. That's, that's easy for me. I just go, hey, it's great. Okay, you're drifting away in danger of going to hell. Okay. Is that real love for somebody? Isn't real love for somebody warning them? Well, they're not going to like it. They're going to get mad at me. All right, well, that's part of the price you pay for loving. <laughs> that's what it means. And we understand that with kids. You know, we always see that. We, we get the thing about tough love, that phrase that surfaced some while back. We understood it. What does it mean? I really love you when I'm willing to suffer your resentment and that kind of thing toward me because I'm doing it because I love you because you, this, you need this. I'm not going to sit here and pander to you so you'll like me. Okay? Well, this is the thing he's talking. He says, look, He's warning them. This writer is willing to warn them. As are all, you can't read the New Testament, right? You can't read anything in the Bible and not see how God loves his people enough to tell them 
when they need to turn. Okay? He loves them enough to do that. Now, he, he tells them, look, he warns them about this, and the word spoken by angels, that's a reference to the Mosaic law. And you say, well, how is that? Well, well there are hints of this in the Old Testament. Okay, the angelic association with the giving of the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, you get whiffs of this in Deuteronomy 33, 2, Psalm 68, 17, but it's mentioned in a number of non-biblical writings, intertestamental literature. You have, you have the book of Jubilees and some other things. You have it mentioned in Josephus, but most importantly, it's mentioned in the New Testament. Acts chapter 7, verse 38, Acts chapter 7, verse 53, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. So there is some way that the angels were involved in the giving of the Mosaic Law. And in the first century, that was understood. So when he writes to them here and he says, listen, if every transgression and disobedience of the word spoken by angels, he's talking about the Mosaic Law. He says, if that word, if that word is something that is, that is punished, he says, how are, you going to, how are you going to escape punishment if you now decide you're going to blow off the word of the superior one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's making this case and, and, and stressing this to them. And then he says in the second part of, of verse 3 and verse 4, the message of salvation came initially from Jesus and was confirmed to the author and his readers by those who heard them. Okay, it came from Jesus and it was confirmed to the author and his readers by their, those who heard Jesus. Though the message, it was, the message was prophesied in the Old Testament, right? It wasn't until Jesus that it was proclaimed as something that had arrived. You have all of these pointers in the Old Testament saying, this is God's work, this is what's going. You know, you, you sit and you're looking at them sometimes, you're trying to put them together and say, what is the writer saying? What is this? You have these pointers, but when Jesus came, when Jesus was born, he lived, he suffered for us. Well, now it has happened. It is a present reality. Okay, that the, the Savior, the basis of God's forgiveness, has appeared in human history and people are called to respond to him. He has now come. He has been promised. He has come. He has died. He has been, ris been resurrected and he ascended to heaven. And now we are called to respond to him. Okay, he, he, though he was prophesied, the Savior, the Savior is now has appeared in human history. And the author and his readers, they were second generation Christians. Not in terms of time necessarily, but they were second generation Christians in the sense they received the word from those who had heard Jesus rather than receiving the word from Jesus directly. Jesus told people, they then told this writer and his readers. Okay, so they're second generation in that sense and that word was confirmed to them by those who heard Jesus. So they get the message from people who got it from Jesus... And that word was confirmed to them, meaning the original hearers guaranteed the accuracy or faithfulness of their message. They come to these guys and say, listen, here is the word we got from Jesus. I'm confirming that to you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm certifying that what I'm telling you is the word I got from Jesus. Well, in doing that, I'm certifying its truth. Why? Because it's from Jesus. I have then certified the truthfulness of it by certifying that the, I'm giving you the message I got from Jesus. Because Jesus, if he gave it, he's the son. The ultimate revelation. That message is true. So they're, they're second generation. It was confirmed to them by those who were the first generation who'd received it. But he also says that God himself confirms the truth of that message or confirmed it. The message they got from the original hearers, the message they got from those who heard Jesus, God confirmed that by the various miraculous manifestations that accompanied the preaching of that message. So here's Jesus to the disciples. He winds up giving the message. They go out and tell people that message. They are confirming. They say, listen, this is the message we got from Jesus. But God also confirmed the truthfulness of their message by miraculous manifestations that accompanied their preaching. He's saying, listen, they're telling you the truth. They're telling you the truth. This one you know who was here, who was crucified, and now is being testified to... You see, when they're telling you that that's true because you see these miracles that are being performed and you see that in a number of places. I have a bunch of scriptures written here. I'll just rattle them off. Mark 16, 20. There's a textual issue there, but uh, Mark 16, 20. Acts 2, 22. Acts 3, 1 through 10. Acts 14, 3 through 11. 
Romans 15, 18, 19, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Galatians 3, 1 through 5, you see this confirming role of God's miraculous manifestations. Now, can miraculous manifestations, are they always certification of something? No, there has to be a theological context, a corroborating theological context where you then can say, we know this Jesus, who he preached, how he lived, what happened, the message that he was raised, and in that context, they then are performing miracles. That's God's seal of approval saying, these guys are telling the truth. And you see what happens is the church just what explodes, explodes. But he's saying here they're second generation Christians. They got the message though. And then in, in verses 5 through 9, in these verses, now this section he resumes. Remember he, in, in 5 through 14, he's nailing down the supremacy of Christ to angels. And then we have this, this interjection where he exhorts people. Greater than the angels, greater than the angels. Therefore, you dare not turn from him and not listen to his message. Okay, well, now he's going to pick back up. He resumes his exposition on Christ that he, quote, interrupted. All right, but it's all part, as I say, the, the preaching style. And he introduces here Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, which this psalm, it contains elements of both exaltation and incarnation, and it therefore serves as a transition from this prior focus on the, on the exalted status of the Son, okay, you have that to the discussion in chapter 2, verses 10 through 18 about the Son's solidarity with humanity. He introduces Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, it's going to serve as a transition. He's been talking about the exalted status, he's going to go on and talk about the incarnation and the identity of the Son with people, and so this is something that serves as a transition there. I'll read it. He says, For he did not subject to angels the coming world concerning which we are speaking, but someone solemnly testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you're concerned for him? You made him for a little while lower than angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You subjected all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subjected to him. But now, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we see the one who was for a little while, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, Jesus, having been crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death on behalf of everyone. Okay? The fact, that, the fact noted in chapter 1, verse 13, that God never said to an angel that he would make his enemies a footstool for his feet, that's reflected in chapter 2, verse 5, in this statement that God did not subject to angels the coming world. See, that's the world about which he was speaking just a minute ago in verses 11 and 12. Okay, the eternal world that will continue after this world is presently constituted is brought to an end at the return of Christ. That's the world he's talking about. He says that world's not subjected to angels. At that time, every being shall kneel, what? Not in honor of an angel, right? Every being shall kneel not in honor of an angel, but in honor of Jesus' name as Lord. And every tongue shall openly confess and openly declare that Jesus is Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Jesus is coming. When he returns, what are we going to get? Every being, every creature, confessing and proclaiming his lordship. On the part of some, it's going to be a forced reverence. On the part of some people, it's not going to be a joyful thing. It's going to be a forced reverence, a submission to one whose power they cannot resist. As F.F. F. Bruce says, I think I quoted this when we were going through Philippians. Bruce remarks on that Philippians text, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, he says... Not only human beings, but also angels and demons in joyful spontaneity or in reluctant fear acknowledge the sovereignty of the crucified one. All beings, in fact, in heaven, on earth, and in the world below. So this idea, see, he says this world we're talking about, this coming consummated reality, it's not going to be subject to angels. It's going to be subject to the Lord Jesus. And he says in Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, which the writer cites that refers not only to the Son's supreme exaltation, but also to the fact that for a brief time, for a brief time, he came to earth and took a status or position that was lower than that of the angels. You say, well, how is that? 
Did he cease to be God? Of course he didn't cease to be God. That's who he is. That's his nature. Well, in what sense was he made lower? And I mentioned this before. He was made lower than the angels because he put himself under human authority. Look what they did to him. Do you think that he couldn't sit here and just say, do you think he couldn't just sit here and say to this whole created order, gone. He can do that. But what did he do? He put himself under human authority that they may abuse him and judge him and spit on him. Angels aren't doing that. The angels are exalted. People aren't sitting there spitting on angels. They did on him. He subjected himself. He brought himself under human authority and let them do this to him. So he was, he was for a while made lower than the angels. See, this is part of the transition that he's going to make to chapter 2, verses 10 through 18, that focuses on the incarnation. See, he's bringing this up and turning the attention there. Then the verses, second part of verse 8 and verse 9, this is important, and i got time to get through it. This, to me, is an important thing, and I think it's just a... Uh, it's all over the Bible, but it's a, it's a neat truth, and I hope I can get it across to you. There's, there's a tension, you see, between the fact Jesus already has been exalted Lord of all things, right? You see that in Philippians, you see that in other places. You see it in Acts chapter 2. Jesus came and died and surrendered. He was crucified, resurrected, ascended to heaven, and is Lord of all. That's what the writer's been saying. He is the exalted Son. See, there is a sense he's already been exalted as Lord over all things, but there's some tension with that fact and the fact some things like death are not yet subjected to him. So he's already exalted over all things and yet there are some things that are not yet subjected to him. You can see that, for instance, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 through 28. Well, see, this tension is reflected in the Psalms that the Hebrews writer write, what he cites. Okay, in in Psalm 110, verse 1, that he cited in chapter 1, verse 13, it alludes to a future subjugation of all things to Christ. Remember, it says, until, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Whereas Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, it suggests that the subjugation of all things to Christ is an accomplished fact. It says there, you put... Or you, or you subjected everything under his feet. Well, in the second part of verse 8 and verse 9 of chapter 2, he is clarifying the relationship of those psalms. Let me quote to you. It's a lengthy quote. I busted it up into a few slides, four of them, I think, of George Guthrie, how he explains this. All right, the author, in effect, answers the question. He says, which is it? Have all things been subjugated to the Son, or does his universal dominance lie in the future? Well, he answers that question with both. You see, we don't always like this stuff, but I'm telling you, theology stuff gets sliced thinly. And that's just how it is. When you look for answers, you know, simple stuff, you wind up forcing things in and it just doesn't work. He answers it with both. At various points, early Christian teachers present Christ's exaltation over the powers as a fait accompli. Uh -huh. Ephesians 1, verse 20, 22 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. This, this accomplished fact, however, might seem confusing at best and tacitly absurd at worst to someone looking at a church ravished by the forces of darkness. Persecuted Christians in Rome may have been asking, why are we being hurt by powers already placed under the feet of Christ? Has God not subjected all things to the Son? Don't we feel that? Don't you feel that in your life? You and I live in a world that is under the authority of Christ, but there is a sense in which his rulership is not yet fully manifested. We live in an overlap of ages in a world that is still characterized by death, suffering, mourning, pain, sin, bummer. These guys are getting the hammer, and so you can see how the question would come up. He continues, he says, the author referring to Psalm 8 answers this question in the affirmative, but based on Psalm 110.1 1, goes on to explain we have, we have yet to see the full impact of his authority. This latter point aligns with other exaltation passages in the New Testament, which also based on Psalm 110.1 1, speak of the subjugation of all things as a future event. For example, 1 Corinthians 15.25 and 26. 
this tension between the now and the not yet. I've mentioned this many times, but I'll continue to mention it because it is an absolutely uh, crucial, I think, uh, idea to grasp that the kingdom, I'll just read this and then I'll run on for a second. He says, this tension between the now and the not yet, between what is present reality but not yet seen, expresses what may be referred to as the inaugurated rule of Christ. That is, the reign of Christ and the reality of Christian experience have begun, but will not be fully actualized until a final consummation at the end of the age. The Son's rule is already a reality. He's ruling. That reality, however, must be confessed by faith until we see its full impact at the end of the age. You see, this is what's happening. You and I live in this time where Christ's kingdom is a present reality. But we live in the overlap of ages. This old age of decay, death, and all this still overlaps. So there's a, there's a sense in which it is hidden. There's a sense in which it's hidden. You look around and you go, wait a minute, man. Christians dying of cancer, all this kind of stuff. What in the world? I thought he's ruling over everything. He is. You see, that's exactly what they were wondering. And he says, listen, he's ruling, but there is a sense in which his authority is yet to be fully expressed. It's like he's the king, but for God's purposes, he is allowing some of these things to continue to rebel. But the time is coming when the Lord Jesus comes back, when this reality will get the ultimate makeover, we will be raised from the dead, and we will live forever in a perfect reality where there's no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. And I love it. I love it. And we will be there, okay? Okay, I must have, I must have gotten Wayne, uh, he, I startled him with that. <laughs> but, but okay, you know, he, he says this now. Let me click on here. And uh, see, w- though we don't yet see the full subjugation of all things to Jesus, what does he mean by that? We live in this world, just as they did. We look around and you see all these things that I was talking about. Though we don't yet see the full subjugation of all things to Jesus, we see, meaning we are aware of through the gospel, we see Jesus who's been crowned with honor and glory because he became a, a human, subject to human authority, was made lower than the angels, and died as a sacrifice for humanity's sins. What do we see? We see through the word of God that where is Jesus? He's exalted. He's exalted. Highest ruler of all things. We see that in Christ and in the word. And this, the, the reference to Christ tasting death on behalf of mankind. That leads into this next unit. Which deals with the son's suffering on behalf of other people. Okay, so you see him. He's moving through this. He says these important things. And now he's talking about his tasting death on behalf of mankind. And he's then going to get into the next section. Which I'll just read and then... Uh, Okay, this the next section, verses 10 through 18. And it was too long for me, and I didn't see a good way to break it up. You know, I usually like to read the whole thing, and if I can fit it all on there, I like to do that, or maybe bust it up into two slides. This was too long, so what I'm going to do, the section's 10 to 18. But I'm just going to walk through it a, a verse or a few verses at a time, kind of grouping them in a way that I think makes sense. But the first thing he says here in this, he says, For it was fitting for him, on account of whom are all things... And through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Okay, it was fitting for him, it was fitting for him to do that. See, having mentioned just in in the last verse, having mentioned Jesus' death on behalf of mankind, the writer proclaims that it was fitting or appropriate for God to save people. Uh, This was fitting or appropriate for God to save people to bring many sons to glory through means of Jesus' death, through his sufferings, to perfect him through sufferings. You say, well, what, how does that make sense? In what way is it fitting for God to save people through the death of Jesus Christ? Well, he doesn't elaborate on that. But, you know, I've read the rest of the New Testament. And so what I'm convinced that he's saying it is fitting, in what sense it was fitting or appropriate, because it's, it's in keeping with God's nature. It's in keeping with his nature. You say, well, how is it in keeping with God's nature? Well, because God is absolutely holy and glorious, and I've talked about this many times. He's absolutely pure, atomic white. He's absolutely glorious glorious and holy. Because of that, he can't simply wink at sin. 
He cannot forgive it without some kind of payment of a penalty because to do that would be what? It would be to trivialize it. It would be to condone evil. You say, well, why would that be? Well, you think of it in some other context. You know, I use the thing about lynchings. You know, think of that. Somebody comes up and they've lynched somebody. Okay? Go to the south. We got a judge sitting there. We bring these guys in front of the judge who are dirty as anything and say, yeah, we lynched this guy. And the judge says, all right, I'll let you go. Well, you say, what do you mean you let him go? He says, I'm being merciful. He said, yeah, but you're being merciful at the expense of justice. You see, you can't do that. And so what would you say about it? How long do you think that judge, well, depends on where you were, but how long would that judge stay there? The judge ought to get the boot. Okay, well, why would he get the boot? Are you unmerciful people? No, you'd say, no, you get the boot because you ignore justice. You've done something wrong. So God is not going to be tainted with that charge. He's not going to be tainted with that charge. You see, there, there, is, there is, in some sense, there's a tension, see, between the aspects of God's nature, between his justice and his mercy, between his holiness and his love, but that tension is not irreconcilable. That tension can be solved, and it's solved in the cross of Jesus Christ because that's where God's justice and his mercy, his holiness and his love are manifested simultaneously. See, so it is a way, you say, why is it fitting for God to bring many sons to glory through the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross? It is fitting because that is the means by which God forgives consistently with his nature. It is the means by which God forgives justly. It is the means by which God forgives righteously. He doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't condone it. He doesn't trivialize it. He bore it. He bore it. There is a tremendous difference in that. He bore it. That's what I think he means when he says it was fitting. It was fitting. This was a fitting means for God to do this. Second bell. Thanks.